Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Have you ever followed after somebody? I don't just mean like you walked behind them on a hiking trail, but really followed someone. Maybe it was an older sibling who you just wanted to be exactly like, and you tried to imitate everything they did and said. Or perhaps it was a teacher or somebody you considered wise, a mentor who who schooled you in the ways of wisdom and you wanted to soak up everything they had to offer you. Or maybe you have or are currently serving in the military and you are following under the authority of your captain or your commander. If you have done any of these things or the many other examples of really following somebody, you know that it's no small thing, that it has pretty broad implications for your life, because after all, what it really means is that you've subjected yourself in some way to the will of another. And it could be their knowledge that you've subjected yourself to, that you want to hear what they have to say because you believe that they know things more than you do. It could be that you want to live like them, like you would an older sibling, and so you subject yourself to doing things the way they do. Or it could be that you've subjected yourself to their authority, like you would as a soldier in an army. To do and go where they say. Well, in our culture, following has been reduced to the simple act of clicking a button on a screen. But even in that small act, it affects a submission. You are giving that person or that entity permission to influence you in some way. You've given them influence you, given them the permission to influence you with their ideas. If there's somebody who speak and try to convince others of things. Or you've given them permission to give you advertisements if you've followed a company or corporation. Well, in our gospel reading today, Jesus is continuing with what we talked about last week, the sending of His twelve disciples now become apostles to the lost sheep of Israel. And He continues to instruct them on how that's going to go. In other words, we're beginning to see the first instances of the fruits of the command of follow me and now it's go and preach. But in our text today, things take a dark turn. The experience that Jesus describes for His disciples is not going to win any sort of persuasive contests. It sounds frightening. But Jesus is preparing them for something that sounds to be not a very pleasant time. It turns out that following Jesus is quite the paradoxical experience. It is both a place of hardship and trial, as well as the only place you will find the peace that everyone strives for, a peace between God and you. So the first part of our section of the gospel reading today is his final specific instructions to the twelve he's sending to Israel. And in verse 21, he says this, Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. Yeesh. Not great stuff. Pretty frightening and scary realities that Jesus is describing. Now, here this is true in a specific way for the apostles, in that often where we go, most people have heard of Jesus and they maybe have a general inkling of what he says. But for them, this is brand new. All the people they're telling about Jesus, they've never heard any of this, and most of them are going to be part of a long-established tradition that Jesus has come to, in many ways, tell them they're wrong about. So you can imagine the conflicts that arise, even within families, should one choose to believe what these men who are sent by Jesus are going to say. Now, there's some general application for us as well, as any of you know who have preached the gospel, who have made a witness of Jesus, it doesn't always end with everyone believing, even among your own family members. And we talked about how following is such a serious thing that it begins to change you and transform you. The words that you speak, the way you behave, the things you choose to do, and all of a sudden that difference can arise even among family members. Well, maybe it'll get better. Let's see. Verse 22, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. I think we're going in the wrong direction here. The family stuff was bad enough, but now it's everybody? 
I'm going to be hated by everyone for the name of Jesus. Now, there's again some specific application for the 12 here because they're changing everything. Jesus is turning everything upside down. If you've ever been in a conversation where you know going in, I'm going to have to tell somebody they're wrong about something, it very rarely goes well. It often takes us time to realize our own mistakes, and it usually doesn't come from someone else telling us, at least not right away. But there's also, again, some general application for us because the world rejects Jesus and His teachings. That's what you and I are sent out with, Jesus and His words. And if the world rejects Him, they're going to reject us. After all, Jesus preaches compassion and mercy and justice, but justice meted out upon Himself. The world doesn't work that way. It doesn't believe in grace and forgiveness. Well, let's go on and see if it, maybe we can make an about face here. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. So Jesus injects a quick promise here that his disciples whom he's sending aren't enduring all these hardships for nothing. In other words, the 12 and all of us whom Jesus sends, there's something in it for us. And that really is quite the understatement because the thing in it for us is eternal salvation. The only source of peace, real peace, that everyone is searching for, the reconciliation of God and man. That is yours in Jesus. That's what he means when he says you are saved. Now we get to verse 23, and in verse 23, Jesus is sort of concluding his instruction to the twelve with some practical advice about what they should do when they face such difficulties. And this doesn't really apply to us in our current context, but it's worth noting. See, Jesus says to them, when you encounter a town who rejects me and the message that I have sent with you, last week we heard the shake the dust off your feet and move on, right? And he's saying, go to all the towns. So if they don't, they, they don't accept you, move on and go to the next. Why? Not because they're unworthy, but because there's not enough time for the Son of Man is coming, and you're not going to be able to reach all of even the towns and cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. So be about it and be quick. Don't linger and try to convince a hardened heart, nor place yourself in danger of being martyred for the cause. That's not the purpose for which Jesus has sent the twelve. But in our very next verse, in verse 24, the discussion shifts from the specific instructions to the twelve to more general observations that Jesus is going to make about the nature of being a disciple. And he kind of marks this off linguistically in Matthew by saying, a disciple is not. So now he's speaking to you. Because the twelve are told to move on, but obviously we're not really called to the same sort of mission of the twelve, at least not most of us. We're not sent on a journey where we're going from one group of people to the next. Most of us are sent into a mission field that's pretty permanent. The places we work and live with our families and the church community that we are in. So what do we do when we face the hardship and trials of discipleship, the rejection of the message and our Lord that we bring with us wherever we go? Well, Jesus goes on, he says that a disciple is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. So he's using these um, examples here for us. So what is, a, what is discipleship like? Well, simply put, it's to be like your teacher the best you can. And if we think about what Jesus, who he was and what he was like, we can sort of see the joy and the blessings, but also the hardship and the trial. And this is the point that Jesus is making. He says it's enough for a disciple to be like their teacher. And then he says this, if they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, what do you think they're going to do for those of his household? Because if we're going to be like Jesus, Jesus was rejected, he suffered, and he died. And we're called to follow in that same path. How much more will they malign those of his household? 
you and me. So if they have the courage to accuse and assault the master of the house, they're not going to mince any bones with his followers. So what does this mean for us as disciples of Jesus? It means that we will, not might or may, but we will face persecution, suffering, and rejection, and in some cases, even earthly death for the sake of the gospel. To the twelve that he's speaking to directly, that is indeed what all of them except for John face up to death. They all face persecution and suffering, and many of them die directly as a result of their affiliation with Jesus. In our current time, though, it's interesting, I think we've been trained by our culture to look in, at some fault of our own for when we face rejection. And this is a worthwhile self-reflection because sometimes it's true. It isn't the gospel that they rejected, but maybe I lost sight of caring for the other person, and I cared more about being right myself and the conversation we had, and then I realized, thinking back, that no, it really was me that, that really um, stepped in it there. Or maybe I spoke harshly when I should have brought compassion and mercy. But it's also important to realize what Jesus is saying here, that even the master of the house, Jesus himself, was rejected suffered and died, because the gospel is offensive to this world. So while it's worthwhile to reflect and make sure that it isn't you that's doing the offending, know that you will offend if you are preaching the gospel. It is a stumbling block to those of no faith. And it makes some sense when you really think it through, because it turns the world upside down. It brings life and salvation to the least worthy of receiving it. So just know that sometimes what's rejected isn't you, but it is the message you bring, and Jesus mentions to His disciples if they reject the message, they reject Him. So how are we supposed to deal with the trials and the suffering? The twelve could move on, but we aren't in a similar situation. Well, for us, we have a local mission field typically. And Jesus has a word for us. He says, have no fear of them. By them, he's referring to those who would would have you undergo persecution at their hands or trials in their courts under their authorities. Have no fear of them are Jesus' first words to his disciples after he explains to them, the master of the house is maligned, you're going to be maligned, have no fear. It makes sense that he would say that because some of the things he's saying sound frightening. Conflict and hatred within families, division and hatred among all the people you're sent to, and most of it directed at you for the sake of Jesus. At this point, the disciples and us, if we're being honest, we're afraid. I don't know if I want to follow Jesus now after he's described what it's going to be like. I mean, who in their right mind would sign up for something like that? But the one who endures to the end will be saved. So he assures us even more after he says, have no fear, by saying a few things. For nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. The truth, the righteousness will have its day. The injustices that you will suffer for my name's sake, the truth of which you are mocked and derided for right now, it will be revealed as truth, and the hidden things will be made known. The things that Jesus is whispering to you right now, He wants you to tell, proclaim loudly to the world, for truth is going to have its day. There is some comfort in knowing that you're on the side of truth. And then his comfort maybe doesn't sound comforting at first, but bear with me. He gives them comfort by saying, well, all they can do is kill you. They can only kill your body. And the thing that we're about is eternal salvation, a matter of body and soul. And so all these enemies that are arrayed against you can do, all they can do is kill your earthly body. 
but fear instead, not those who can only do that to you, but those, the one who can kill body and soul in hell. Now, I have to admit, when I was a kid, I thought that was talking about the devil, but the devil can't even do that. The only one who can destroy body and soul is God himself. In other words, fear God, don't fear man. Proverbs tell us that fearing God is the beginning of wisdom, but at first, you're like, okay, Jesus, more threats? I'm supposed to be afraid of God because He can totally kill me and they can only sort of kill me? I'm still not so sure about this discipleship thing. But then Jesus continues His encouragement by describing the only one whom you should fear, how He actually feels about you. The nature of His relationship to you now that Jesus has come into the picture. So it gives you the image of a sparrow, and our translation says a penny. It's really meant to represent like half an hour's worth of work is what a sparrow is worth. So very small. None of those fall without knowledge of the Father. He's even paying attention to the insignificant sparrow. And how much is he paying attention to you? He knows the numbers, the hairs on your head. So do not fear man. Fear God. Fear God, for He has the authority to totally destroy body and soul, and yet that one loves you and is paying attention to you to such a degree that He even knows the numbers of the hairs on your head. Now, at first, that may seem strange as an encouragement, but if you think about it, when we are suffering for the sake of the gospel, what is our first fear? Our first fear is that God has abandoned us that He's left us alone, and here Jesus is assuring us He's paying attention even to the sparrows, and you are worth more than many sparrows. So He's not gone away. He's paying close attention and care to you. But notice that Jesus doesn't say you're not going to suffer, but that God will be with you in the midst of whatever it is that you are going to endure for His name. And you can be assured You do not need to fear. And lastly, he closes with a promise. Confess me before men, and I will confess you before my Father who is in heaven. Now, it can be often confused. This isn't really referring to like a single instance where maybe you're afraid to say things about Jesus because you're afraid that you're going to be made fun of or attacked or lose your reputation or your job or whatever it might be for standing up for the truth. But the same Greek word that Matthew uses here, he uses in another instance in Matthew, and that's when Peter denies Jesus in the courtyard. So even though Peter denied Jesus, what happens to Peter? He repents of his denial and is still saved. So the reality being described here about the one who denies God before men, and then in turn Jesus denies him before his Father, is the one who rejects the faith, who rejects Jesus and his teachings and does not repent, which is not what we want as His disciples, and so He sends us out to bring Jesus to them. But what began with follow me has now begun to be go and preach. And the same that He sends the twelve out is true for us today. What does that mean? What does that look like for us? Is it, well, it means that while we must continue to come here and rest in His grace and graciously receive by His mercy, the gifts that He wishes to give us. He doesn't wish us to stay seated here, but to go out so that more may come here and receive the very gifts that you enjoy by preaching what He has given you to preach, the Word that He has given you to bring to wherever it is that He has sent you, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, or in just our church community. It's going to mean difficulty. You will have to make sacrifices You will face persecution just like the disciples did all those years ago and Christians have faced throughout the history of the church. Know that that's a reality going in and that sometimes, sometimes you can correct your mistakes and do something about it, but sometimes there's nothing you can do for their rejecting Jesus and His gospel. But also know this, that the prize is eternal salvation the likes of which no one can take away from you. And the one who can, the one who you should be in fear of, loves you so deeply that He sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross 
to save you when you weren't worth saving. So, dear friends in Christ, go forth in the fear of the Lord, for He even knows the number of the hairs on your head. And boldly confess Christ as God and Lord, for He will guard you even on the difficult way that He leads you through, until He welcomes you into His kingdom and confesses your name before the Father and says, this one is mine. In the name of Jesus, amen.